All right, so as she said, my name is Dylan Barnes, and the topic of the hour is data-driven decisions. Now, this topic is a little bit vague and maybe also not the most exciting, but um, it can boil down to one word, and that word is curiosity. Um, I'm personally not a parent, but I imagine many of you guys here are parents. Parents, hands, anybody? At least a few, okay, good. So you'll know if you have kids that there's a certain age where the only word they wanna say is why. Why mommy, why daddy, why do I have to do this? Why can't I do that? It's the only thing that comes out of their mouths. Of course, then we start getting a little bit older and we stop saying why, start ask, stop asking why, and start saying this is just how things are. And really, this is the exact opposite behavior that you want if you're trying to drive a business. You want to keep asking why, why, why. So this curiosity is what leads us to knowledge, and then we learn in school that knowledge is power, and then we learn in work that, well, power is money. And if you're in the same business as me, we're all in the business of making money. So today, what I'm gonna talk about is I will give um, a brief introduction of what I do and how we use data to drive our business forward. And um, then I'll, I'll go into some examples and concepts that will hopefully spark some curiosity in your minds about how you can use data to also try something new and learn something new in your business and drive your business forward. So as she mentioned, I work for Area Games. Area Games is a free-to-play games publisher. Um, right now, we're headquartered in Berlin. Um, of course, as you might have guessed, I'm not German. In fact, actually, there are more French people working in our office than there are Germans. So as you can imagine, lots of different nationalities. Just a quick question for you guys. How many of you work for publishers? <laughs> Two publishers, that's all. Developers? Wonderful, good. All right, so I'll just give you a quick uh, overview of, of what we're looking for and what we do when we're uh, going through the publishing process. So it's very simple. For us, we hire people, we talk with you guys, we license a game, we run some marketing, we get some players in there. Hopefully, a lot of them retain, and uh, in the end, hopefully they monetize. We all make money, we get paychecks, we go home, everything's wonderful and dandy. But the reason I bring this up is pretty simple. Uh, when people are asking me about data and how can we be more data-driven, what does it mean to be data-driven, um, there's this kind of misconception that they're asking, um, oh, what type of uh, Microsoft Excel documents are you using? What type of tools do you use? And really, that's not where it starts. Um, in reality, what you need is, is data-driven characteristics from the entire process of the business, from the start to the finish. It's not just having a fancy Excel document. You can't just... Um, say, uh, let's hire an, an analyst, let's hire two analysts, and then you can know, oh, okay, now we're, know, know, we're gonna know what we're doing and we know how to drive the business forward. It's, it's not so simple. It really needs to be an underlying characteristic of your entire business. So, but before I move on, I do wanna take one step back and mention one very, very critical key. So in area, we have company values, just like pretty much every company has their own values and missions, et cetera. But, uh, well, I'm not here to give you a spiel about that, but I do want to bring up one very important value, and that is adaptability. Before we even talk about data, you need to talk about adaptability. There really is no point in gathering data, talking about data, or any of this, if you're not willing to adapt to what the data is telling you. Um, you could have all the data in the world and say, well, we just can't do it. We don't want to do it. It seems risky. Then there's really no point. You're just wasting your own time. So I do want to say this is very important because adapting is really difficult. It puts a lot of stress on your employees, it puts a lot of stress on your operations, it puts a lot of stress on everything, but it's the only way to make use of the data you're getting and the only way to drive your business forward or you end up uh, manufacturing horses and carriages uh, in the 1900s. So, to start off, in order to make data-driven decisions, you need data-driven people before you even can talk about data, right? So one thing that we've learned is that you don't hire just gamers. You don't want a company full of just gamers, nor do you want a company full of just businessmen. If you only have one type of person, you only have one perspective on the data you have. And you end up with people, uh, this is the only thing we can do, everybody agrees, you all do it. You need the different perspectives, you need the mix of viewpoints and skill sets to really be able to see the reality that your data is showing you. Otherwise, again, you're wasting time. Then, you put them through a bit of a boot camp. And this part is pretty essential. You don't need to yell at them as if you were in the military and say, ah, you're worthless, you're worthless. But really, you do need to challenge people. 
and you need to say, give them a problem and let them dig and dig really deep and figure out what the situation is going on. And they need to have some failures and they need to have some successes and you need to help them along through this, giving them some numbers, giving them some stuff to work with, and then they need to come to you with an answer. Really, the idea here is that comfort is the death of progress. If you have comfortable people who think that I only need to check one piece of data and then I'm good, you're not going to get anywhere. So uh, the idea here is to build a, a behavior that when people are digging, they find one answer and then you say, okay, well, what's next? And they go, oh, okay, um, I guess I have two more questions now. And you want people to say, as soon as I find an answer, you find two more questions. It's the only way to get people to continuously look and strive and look for more information and never be satisfied with the information they have. Again, this is the only way to keep moving forward. To do this, of course, you let them crunch all, crunch all the numbers, look at all the metrics, give them way more information than they can work with, and hopefully in the end, they come out all right. This is how you keep setting the bar higher and higher for your analytics. Again, this is really just a foundation of everything because you want your employees, before any data actually starts happening, you want them to say, to have the characteristic that they can ask, what am I missing? What else can I look into? I need to figure out what I need to do next, but I'm not quite sure if I know yet. What else can I check? So um, the next part, of course, is finding a game. Well, I don't need to be the one to tell you that the market is quite challenging. Most games that launch don't quite make it in the end. We probably all have our own checklists for what makes a successful game. Um, we probably check the usual suspects, at least as a publisher. We'll look at retention, ARPU, ARPPU, what's the conversion, all the normal stuff. Maybe we'll dig into the game mechanics and the game design formulas and start seeing does it match what we're looking for, does it match our target audience and things like this. But really, we could have a week-long seminar about what makes a successful game and still only be scratching the surface. That's not what I'm here to talk about. But I do want to simplify something. What does your successful product look like in one year? And then, do you have the information you need to get it there? Going from concept to building a game to launching a game to one year of operations is all entirely different. I need to ask yourselves, do you have all the tools, all the data, all the economic information to address any balance issues, to address any, any, um, any problems with the game economy. Sometimes the game, the game economy looks, yeah, we designed it perfectly, it's great, and then after one month, everything is messed up. How are you gonna deal with it? Are you prepared to act and add more information that will tell you this, this is what you need to do to fix things? Are you ready to handle one year of operations at least? What this is about is really building a development infrastructure for making data-driven decisions. Just like you need data-driven people to make data-driven decisions, you also need data. It needs to be coming. Uh, there's a lot of developers here, so your tools need to be telling you, this is what the players are doing, this is where they're dropping off, this is what they have, this is what they don't have. If you don't have the people and you don't have the development infrastructure, you can't really get anywhere again. Um, this is also the point where you have to start looking for certain red flags. Um, for example, if you make a significant decision about the game and you ask why and the person says, well, because it sounds good, this is what I think, this, this is right, yeah, I, I know it, I know it, this is, this is, this is going to work. That's a red flag. They should at least have some thought or some concept or some sort of justification for what they're doing or at least some sort of ability to react to what they say. So watch out for these things because they can be trouble. Anyway, now it's on to the actual meat of the presentation and the business. So in um, the first real step for running a game, of course, is acquiring players. And this boils down to one fundamental equation that um, basically holds the entire business hostage. And that is, is the cost of acquiring a player greater than or less than the lifetime value of a player? Very simple, very basic, but we all have to deal with it. Um, so what you do is you, you, you get some ads, you throw some ads out on the market, you get some clicks, you get some registrations, hopefully you get players, again, hopefully they retain a certain retention rate, factor in some conversion, some monetization, and you end up with a lifetime value. And hopefully you find out then that you're able to market your game, or you're not able to market the game. Um, I mean, cost per players can easily be four, five dollars, easily ten dollars without a problem. It's easy to spend that money, but the lifetime value um, getting up to four, five, ten dollars is not easy. That's very, very tricky. <clears throat> and some of these aspects you can, you can, uh, you can impact a lot of these um, steps. 
you know, you can A-B test banners and you could say, oh, does this banner have a better click-through rate than that banner? You can maybe adjust your registration flow to remove drop-off points and make it so it takes three clicks to create an account rather than seven clicks to create an account. But in the end, it's a pretty basic uh, process. It's pretty uh, straightforward. Until it's not. So the, what do you do in a situation where you have multiple marketing channels that you're trying to synergize off of each other? How do you optimize and allocate the prices? This starts to get a little bit tricky. And then how do you actually predict the lifetime value of your players? Are you going to wait one year before you start marketing your game? This seems a little bit silly, don't you think? So then you have to start digging around and looking and seeing if there are things you could do. So maybe you say, OK, I'm going to look at some multipliers. I'm going to say the 90-day uh, the lifetime value of a player. If you multiply it by two, you get the one-year lifetime value of a player. Maybe this gets you some rough estimates, sure. But not all games monetize at the same speed. You have to think of some other things. Some games monetize faster. Some games, within three months, you get almost everything out of a player that you will. And some games take three years. So then what do you dig into? Does a game start converting at three days or 30 days? What's in the game design formulas? I think you guys probably know better than I do that um, we build these formulas to figure out how much time it takes to use for users to go through certain content and achieve certain content. Where does that lead the user? When do they start hitting paywalls? Where's the first paywall? Where's the second paywall? After how much time? This will give you an idea of how to actually estimate your lifetime value. And of course, you need to estimate your lifetime value to convince somebody to spend marketing for you, right? Really, the emphasis here is that you need to put a lot of attention into this aspect because um, this will shape the entire marketing process of your game and set the foundation for your live operations. This is not something that you want to guess. This is not something where you say, um, let's just throw a bunch of money in there and um, let's, yeah, I think the lifetime value will be great. This is not really a good way to convince your boss that uh, you should spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, right? And then you move on. Next step, the retention process. Um, you guys have probably spent a lot of time figuring out what's happening in your games and what happens with the retention. Retention is really a complicated metric. There are a lot of different activities and experiences that a user goes through that factor in to build a, a retention process. You probably know better than me. So how do you actually break this data down? How do you interpret it? How do you know what actions you should take based on what you're seeing? There's a lot of different complicating factors that can change your retention rates. Um, look at this example. Um, for temporarily, there was a drop in three-day retention, and then there was a spike in three-day retention afterwards. It's a little a bit odd. It's kind of some strange behavior. And again, if you note, the bottom line is paid retention, so users coming in through paid campaigns, and the top line is organic, people who are just directly going to the website and to play the game or coming through Google or something like this. It's a little bit odd, but actually, in reality, the situation isn't too confusing. There was a patch for this game. Uh, the patch introduced some technical problems. There was some stability. Uh, there was a long maintenance. This led to a temporary decrease in three-day retention, causing some problems for those new users that started. Then afterwards, the patch content itself had some uh, login incentives, where after seven days, users would get a reward for um, logging in. But the reward was tradable. So the players were creating new accounts, logging in, getting the reward, and sending it back to their main accounts. This is why you have an increase, a temporary increase in three-day retention. Again, this is something, uh, kind of an easy example of things not to do. Just be careful, right? But it's not always so str straightforward. In this case, you would, uh, in the previous case at least, you would have been looking at the dates and you would see, oh yeah, we went live with a patch then. Oh, oh okay, I see what's happening now. You pr probably figure it out pretty quickly. Here, there are no changes to the game. Retention decreased temporarily. Don't know why. Nothing happened to the game. So we started asking questions, what's happening? And this was a little bit less straightforward, but not necessarily illogical. Apparently, the Euro Cup can impact retention negatively. Now, the US isn't charted on here, but I'm sure the US probably wasn't impacted so much. But sometimes you really have to think outside of the box to figure out what's happening with your retention rates. Try to figure out how do you break these things down to learn pieces of information. Remove these complicating factors like this that are out of your control or are just uh, one-time occurrences or temporary. 
in this case, I've just split on retention by three days, but really there are a lot of different ways to look at retention. You can consider more than just actual days. You can look at playtime in the game. How many people retain past five hours of play sessions, for example? Or you can consider what level they reach. Um, you can consider in a shooter how many kills they get. You can consider in-game circumstances, such as did they complete the tutorial? Did they fail or win on the first dungeon? Did they join a guild? Did they join a clan? Do people re retain better if they join a clan? These are all the types of questions that you'll need to ask yourselves, and you have to split down your retention information to find out specifically what you need to know. If you're looking at 40% uh, three-day retention, and um, somebody says, hey, make it 45%, uh, OK. W what are you supposed to do with that? You need to break it down, split it down, remove complicating factors, and start looking at specific areas that you can impact. An, an obvious one is always the tutorial. What are the drop-off points of the tutorial? And what happens? And what can you do? How can, can, do you reduce the steps? Do you increase the steps? Is there confusion? Things like this. And then, of course, there is the monetization aspect. This is probably one of the most interesting parts of the process. In monetization, there are a lot of options, but unlike the um, retention side, you can usually work with them much faster. Uh, when you're adding content into a game, it can take months to figuring out the right content, QAing it, and getting out into the game. And then you have to wait for information. When it comes to monetization, you can run promotions pretty much every week. And then you can track the information and see what's happening in, in uh, your revenue. The idea is, well, how do you maximize your monetization without breaking anything in the game, without hurting retention, without uh, just destroying sales in the future to make some quick money now? And then how do you identify these inefficiencies in your monetization strategy? And of course, this is absolutely critical because it goes right back to the fundamental equation that we all struggle with, and that is the cost per player. If you can't afford to spend uh, the marketing money to make the players, well, what do you do? So if you can maximize your monetization to the point where you can make marketing, you suddenly have a lot more impact and a lot more control and a lot more success with your product. But there are a lot of different factors to look at for monetization. It can be very convoluted and very complicated. For example, just some basics. What are your currencies doing? Your primary and secondary currencies. Are they trending up? Are they trending down? Are they high? Are they low? And why? Is there something in the game economy that's happening that is mess are messing with the currencies? What about the items? What items are in demand? What items aren't in demand? And why? How many of them are in the game economy? And why? Are they serving the intended function? Sometimes items are used for separate functions. They become tertiary currencies. Or um, users find out that there's some inefficiencies in the game economy. And if they buy this item and do this process, they can really make a lot more uh, in-game currency from this other mechanic. A lot of things that you need to pick apart and find. And then there's the promotion aspect. What's the awareness of your promotions? What's the communication of your promotions? Are they aware of what you're doing? Do they care about what you're doing? Is it interesting for them? How about uh, the promotion compared to the last promotion? Is the ARPU any better? Is it worse? What about the price? Price is an easy one. You can always change the price. Should the price be higher or lower? How do you know? And the item mix, what items do your users want? And if they don't want them, why not? And lastly, spenders. What types of spenders are you activating? What types of spenders can you activate? There are a lot of different spenders out there who are motivated by different behaviors and different patterns and are looking for different things in their game. How can you identify them? What could you do if you knew what they wanted? They certainly have different price elasticities. So maybe some are looking for vanity items. Some are looking for uh, speeding things up. Some are looking to strengthen their, their guilds or clans. These are all things that can be tracked. These are all things that can be followed very acutely. You can have all sorts of different tools to track all these different things I've mentioned. And then you can experiment on them. You can say, oh, if I change the price, what happens? OK, oh, that didn't work. OK, change it back. Let's tr change something else. Let's use a different item. Again, it's the experimentation process that's going to lead you to maximizing your revenue potential, which again will feed back to the lifetime value. Basically, everything is out there. You can impact everything, but you have to be patient and you have to track everything. Otherwise, 
you say, okay, last time I did this, this time, yeah, it was okay, maybe I'll try this. But if you don't track what you're doing and you don't look at the data and say, actually, the data shows that you had less spenders and they spent more, okay, what does that mean? If you don't track it, if you don't know what you're doing, and maybe you get lucky and you find the right way to do it, or maybe you don't. The key there is to track it and listen to what the data is telling you. So let's go over an example. There was a monetization event added into a first-person shooter that we managed um, last year. The event is basically, it's, like a, it's a gambling mechanic where you spend a certain amount of money, you get an item. You're guaranteed one item. Um, but you don't get to pick which item, but you can't win the same item twice. So there's a maximum amount of items that you can win. We launched this new event. It made some money. Revenue went up. Good. Not so bad. We were pretty happy. We made some extra money. We all like money, of course. But then we thought, well, it can probably be better. So we just changed a few basic things. We changed the price. We changed the item mix. We changed the quantity of items. Looked at what the data said and tried it again. Revenue went up again. Again, this is actually getting pretty nice. It's quite significantly higher than the other months. We didn't really think there was maybe much more we could do, but we did it one more time. And again, we doubled the revenue from November to December. Of course, December is always going to be higher, but actually we're very, very pleased with the results of this. But it leads to some very, very natural and very expected questions. You can't just spike revenue and assume that nothing else is happening, right? With so for example, did we cannibalize any sales? Did the users just spend on this and then they suddenly stop spending everything else? But you can track this. How much did they spend before they participated in this event? How much did they spend on the event? And then how much did they spend afterwards? And then the other question, people in the second time and the third time, were they from the first time as well? Or did they drop off? So if you run it once, do you end up running a nice event? Everybody spends a bunch of money and then they have everything they want and they don't want anything more? Well, that's something that needs to be considered. In this case, we found out that that wasn't the case, but you have to be careful with how you're running your promotions because it's really easy to make that mistake. Which is to say, oh, we've got something great and we sell it, we make a lot of money, and then suddenly you can't come up with anything better, better than that. <coughs> so in our case, um, we played around with the item mix. Uh, we, we were able to increase the desirability by really focusing on what the players wanted and what their attention was driving towards. This also reduced development waste. And actually, with all the developers here, I hope uh, this means something to you. As publishers sometimes have this nasty habit of just uh, burning content, making money, and then telling the developers to give you more. But actually, the well, of course, content isn't infinite. Revenue per content is a very important thing to keep your eye on. If you create 20 items, how much money do you make from it? In this case, we were actually to increase the revenue per content by just focusing on what the users wanted and seeing what what did they like? What, what were they using in the end? Maybe they got all these items, but what did they end up using? There are a lot of different things you could consider. <clears throat> in our case, all we really had to do was just be patient and keep poking around, keep trying things. In the end, it was very successful. But it doesn't mean you can end up being very unsuccessful in this process. There are a lot of warnings that I'd want to leave you with. When you're looking at data, well, it can be really tricky. Data never lies. Numbers never lie, but they're certainly not always straightforward. There's some things you need to watch out for. One, you will find inconsistencies. Usually, an inconsistency, it just means that you haven't fully understood what's happening, and you need to look for more. In this case, I would say just get some other opinions. See what you can find. And then, of course, correlation is not causation. That is a big one. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> you will really damage things if you assume that's the case. Um, and then, of course, um, there are other things that are, are, are complicating the situations. You can always find data to support a bad decision. You can always say, uh, I'm going to take this metric to so that say that we should do this, when actually all the other metrics tell you not to. This is where you need people to, with different perspectives to say, oh, wait, why are you doing this again? Oh, can you explain this for me? And then ask, did you think about this? Did you think about this? That's something that you want to hear a lot in your environment with your coworkers, no matter who you are. Did you think about this other thing? And not just say, oh, I like your idea. That's good. <clears throat> and then situations change. Your data may say, this is what we should do. And then the market goes in a different direction. The game goes in a different direction. The player behavior isn't what's anticipated. You expected this mechanic to really drive the users, and then suddenly 
they're not. The, the, the usage of that mechanic or the playtime on that mechanic suddenly is much lower than expected. So you have to be careful. Data is a tool for you. It's not perfect. It's not going to make your business foolproof, but there are a lot of things you can do with it. And then, of course, data might tell you something, but you also need to execute on it. And execution is just as important. If you can't execute properly, no matter what the data says, you're not going to pull it off. You have to be very careful with the execution and make sure that's up to par. And then, of course, uh, there are things that you just can't know until you've done them. And sometimes it looks good, you do it, everything seems fine, and then you find out something new after the fact. Of course, it's always easier looking backwards to say, well, we should have known that. And in that case, take some notes, write down the information, and move on. Go to the next thing. On that note, actually, I wish you good luck with your Excel adventures, because there's lots of information out there to gather. Does anyone have any questions? Nothing? Nobody? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I guess you guys have questions, right? I've got a free game for a mic. It's on. So please introduce yourself. Tell us more about your life, your story. Okay, I have a cat. <laughs> no, my name is Adrian. Um, what I would like to know is, looking at data is interesting only if you can benchmark it. So here you do by iteration, you improve your game, but how do you compare with competitors, for example? Because it's good when you are in your own ecosystems, you might have heard, okay, the RPU in that kind of game is, should be about that, but there is no tangible, like proven uh, benchmark. Well, there Compared are to, for example, I, I, I used to work in packaged goods and we have sales of competitors and that's you know, factual. This is sales of a good game, this is sales of a bad game. And, but for mobile or online games, it seems a lot more hectic. In a case like that, I would focus on, well, number one, you can find some data out there that will give you a rough idea, but then you would dive into the mechanics and you would try to pick apart the game formulas. Um, in that case, you should be able to learn a lot of things about what the competitors are doing uh, with their mechanics in terms of uh, time versus money and things like this, and that you can compare those to your own mechanics. And I'm sure you would be able to find some comparabilities between different different games. I can answer you. Uh, there are quite a lot of reports on, for example, average revenue per user or average revenue per paying user from super data or other data aggregating companies. So it is pretty easy to find the benchmark. Hey, what's your name? Hi, my name is Dilber Mann. I'm a development director for Relic Entertainment. Um, I just had a, you, you touched a little bit on uh, s different stakeholders in the organization and I just wanted to kind of get your perspective based on your experience. Uh, which uh, stakeholders are often missed in terms of when you're trying to create a data-driven organization or data-driven approach to making decisions. I often find that there are disciplines that are lost in that um, uh, creation of a data-driven approach. I just want to know from your experience, um, which ones are we often missing or not including in that uh, evaluation or those discussions? Well, I work for a publisher, so oftentimes the product managers in, in in our company sometimes forget about a lot of the really deep uh, game mechanics. So I imagine that's probably different when you're a developer where you focus more on the deep game mechanics, but sometimes we focus a lot more on the promotion, so we miss things in the game mechanics. Um, there are also probably, um, on the customer service side, there's probably a few things that are lost as well and that sometimes go a bit unnoticed. 
the customer service side usually has a lot of information about your whales and where your revenues com are coming from. This is where you'll probably start seeing a lot of um, character or uh, user psychology and user profile information that sometimes goes unnoticed. Um, but there's definitely a lot of value there, uh, particularly in, in paying attention to and tracking your VIPs.